a lot of people joined with us today are asking themselves, Jamie, Chris, now what? You know, especially yeah. after a chaotic and unpredictable 2020 and out of chaos, out of death comes a resurrection, out of chaos can come innovation, opportunity. Right. And so I want to lay the groundwork essentially for the rest of the conversation. If, if you'd be so kind, can you give us an overview, maybe just the flyover of chaos theory and really what's at stake right now? And let's dive deeply then into what we were texting about. Right. So, yeah. So, I mean, I think there's lots to chaos theory, but really the, the thing that is most fascinating to me is about what chaos theory does it, 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 when, when, when the beauty of chaos theory is that it demonstrates in the chaos what is the main attractor. And I was using this super simple illustration of a dryer ball because so when you, when you, when you t put a dryer ball in a dryer and you just drop it, it just goes straight to the bottom. So what you know in that scenario where there's no chaos, it's a very fixed system, is that the, the thing that's the motivator, the mover behind the dryer ball is the gravity pull downward. So that gravity is the main thing. So we can say in our own life, day to day, when nothing really, you know, everything's kind of going as we planned it and think it and it's formula. We can get into this formula of, oh yeah, I know this is my main thing. This is the main thing I do. Well, it could be the main thing you do, but it may not be the main thing you do. And you don't know until that world is turned upside down. Mm. Then you start to find out, wow, now what's my main attractor? So you have the ball in the dryer and you turn the dryer on. And so the dryer starts to spin. Now that ball is going all over the place in a way that you can't predict. Inside the dryer, though, the chaos is, you know, this is quantum, but the chaos does follow a predictable scientific pattern. We just only know the probability of where it would go, but it's not going to go outside the dryer. So it's not like out of control. It's out of control. We're all going to die. It's just now the ball is, has other things making it move that are hitting it, striking it and causing it to go in directions it wouldn't go if it was just a normal Monday, straight down, straight to the greatest attractor. So I could say in my everyday life, yeah, I love God. God's my main attractor. I'm, we're, I'm moving towards God, but then chaos hits. And then I start getting thrown all over the place like this. Then there's other things there's other things impacting my decision-making or Ken. And what happens in Ken, the danger of chaos is that you will lose, you'll lose sight of what is the main thing because now it's all unpredictable, but it's not out of control. It's not violating the dryer is following all the laws of physics perfectly. It's just, we can't tell what's gonna happen next to us so it's actually a more realistic view of the world is the turning dryer than this. Well, every day is just going to be, well, it's not true. And that, you know, that's when you get into the idea. We want predictability. We want certainty. We don't want any mystery. We want to know what's going to happen. We want to know that when we do this, this results. But that's a very false view of the world. It's a very wrong view of the world. And so we try and control it. Like, I'd rather just have the dryer stop and never work. No, that's not true. That is not what you want. You want that movement and motion because the movement and motion forces you to say, wow, what is the main attractor? So even though the ball's bouncing all over the dryer, it's still trying to go in the one direction. It's still moving down all the time, even though it's bouncing all over the place. So it is still moving towards its main attractor, but the chaos is causing it to do things it wouldn't normally do. So, so yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No. So just in my life, do I really want as a human, do I really want a predictable, formulaic, under control, self-focused life? Is that really, we think we do. Mm -hmm. We think we want to know everything that's going to happen in a predictable fashion that never varies, but it's not really what we want. What we want is to be alive and free. We want mystery. We want it, but it terrifies us. So chaotic events, unpredictable events, 
allow us to be creative. Like it produces, it forces us to say, okay, this year is not gonna be what we planned in any way. So what are we gonna do? Move into despair? You can, but then you realize, oh, the main attractor in my life is my own, my own is myself, my own, you know, comfort, my own. And the chaos forces you to confess or tell the truth. Wow, I don't like it when I'm not in charge. Well, then you're going to have a hard time the rest of your life because you're never in charge. And the lie is to believe that, um, wow, if I just go eat this fruit, I'll be like God. You know, that's the lie. But it produces separation, right? And so, so the, that's what chaos produces creativity. And it helps us actually know more truthfully who we really are. You know, that's what the old saying, chaos doesn't prove a man chaos doesn't make a man chaos shows the man like a crisis doesn't make a person it reveals a person so in any kind of you know intensive training the goal is to put you under pressure to see who you really are not in a controlled environment where you're that's not the, the true identity doesn't need to be there the true identity comes alive in chaos and creativity because our highest, I, I think, my opinion, our highest act of worship with the creator God is to co-create. Mm -hmm. We won't co-create in a, in a world of formulas and, and predictability. We won't. We don't need to. We just got to know the right formula and follow it. That's all. And that's what most of us are trying to do. Things like COVID, things like this you know, in a universe that's, that's, that's not run on Newtonian physics, it's very unpredictable, but it doesn't violate the laws that govern the universe. There's no violation of the laws that govern the universe. It's just that one law is you can't predict it. <laughs> that's one of the laws, but, but you, but there are probabilities that are always true, that will always be true. So then we can go to Love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is, this is the rule of living. Well, what is, is that a predictable formula? No. But do we know the result of it? Yes, we do. Yeah. Does it mean I'm going to be rich and famous? No. Mm -hmm. Does it mean I'm going to become fully who I am? Yes, it does. What does that look like? Oh, we don't know. So it's very beautiful. It's actually quite beautiful if you can move, you're free to move, you're alive and free to move in the chaos, always with your true main attractor being the love of God. So what's required of us then? I want to double click on it in a minute. Let's rewind to 2020. COVID yeah. hits. Everything right. is not interrupted, but instead disrupted. Yeah. Along with that, you and I have talked about this, by the way, time out, Jamie, this is year number five. You've been on win today every year since oh, 2016. Wow. So oh, I'm yeah. just, oh, I, I, love just being here. I love it. Um, okay. So let's rewind. Let's double click on this. Then fear, guilt, shame, get in the way yep. when disruption happens. Right. Yeah. What's required of us in order to do exactly what you just said and be free flowing? Because if the motivator of fear, guilt, and shame is driving the bus, right? We're not going to innovate out of chaos. Like, what's right. required of us? Can we double click on that? Yeah. So, well, I think I think it comes. You know, as a as a as a believer, as a Christ follower, for me, the question is. It, it comes down, these, these chaotic events force us to truth tell. I think that's the greatest value of anything that happens to us is it forces us to tell, it gives us opportunity to tell the truth, I should mm -hmm. say. Um, because truth telling, we, we know that, that knowing and experiencing truth always liberates, always So when we're, so, so we can say, okay, well, if, I, if I'm talking to a person who's not alive and free, I can say with be just because I'm a human too, that the reason they're not is because what they believe about either themselves, the universe or others is false. Hmm. 
right? So if I, so if the chaotic world throws me into despair, it means that what I believe about myself is I'm powerless. It means what I believe about the universe is it's against me. And what I believe about others is they're my enemy. That's what, it, that's what chaos. So mm. it forces you to say, well, why are you so afraid? Because I'm going to die in this situation. That's really the ultimate statement. Why are you, why? Because I'm not able, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough to survive this Two, God is against me or the universe is against me or life is, I, I, it's a war. It's me against, it's very Hemingway. You know, life is going to kill me in the end. It's going to destroy me in the end. I can have moments of brief happiness, but that, and then the, or that the other, it's Cain and Abel. Abel is my adversary. I'm in competition. So what can I do? So it forces us to truth tell about this. The, the thing about conf confession that makes it valuable is once you truth tell, then you're able to listen to or for what's actually true. Like, so I can say this chaos has forced me to say that I believe my life is out of control and it'll never be under control. Okay, so part of that's true. That's right. So, but does it mean you're going to die? No, it means you can actually stop trying to control everything and you'll be fine. What are we, I mean, that's one of the greatest reliefs there ever is. Like, I don't have to be in charge and it still can be beautiful. That's when it becomes beautiful is when you stop rearranging the room every time you come into it. It's just, you know, as Richard Rohr says, just practice sitting in rooms without adjusting anything. Just practice that. Just go into them. Don't change the temperature. Don't adjust the chair. Just take, receive the room as it is. And just learn to receive the room as it comes mm -hmm. and the other person as they come and, you know, life as it comes. And so, yeah, that's the, that's the value of it. The beauty of it is to truth tell and to understand what do I believe about this thing that's absolutely not true. And the chaos is allowing me to see the false belief. It's really interesting. And I, I'd love to poke this with you, Jamie. I'm happy to be candid with everyone listening because I shared with you before we hit record here that, I've really been walking through some burnout. Now, having heard what you just said, I'm starting to think that burnout may be a symptom of the attempt to keep everything in order and to keep control of everything, right? That's the, right. The, the yep. fear that motivates losing control right. causes the burnout. And mm -hmm. I could be really wrong, but I just love to hear your thoughts if, you've had, if you have any. Yeah. So to me, so, you know, that there's that that passage, you know, that tells us do not grow weary and well-doing like yeah. it it's uh, so the first question is, okay, so what am I weary of? Mm -hmm. What am I weary of? And so what we would hope, I mean, you know, it sounds kind of funny, but the spirit in leading us in all truth, one of the, th the things the spirit is always going to say is like, this is not something God has invited you into. This is not something God has invited you into. How do we know that it's not something that God has not invited us into? It becomes a burden. It burns us out. It weighs us down. And Jesus said it. Look, let me tell you something. When something becomes a burden to you, you your number one response is lay it down. That is the first thing you do. You lay it down. Lots of times when I'm in prayer and I'm confessing, God, this is like, ugh, this is like so heavy. It's all, he's always like, drop it, drop it. Remember he came to serve. He came to serve. He, he came to wash our feet. He didn't come to be served. So sometimes I feel like the Lord's saying to me, why are you working so hard to serve me? Like, what are you doing? Like, I'm here to serve you. Like I came to serve you. So here's what, I've, here's what I'm offering you, a life of following me. Like I'm offering you this where I'll invite you and you come. But when you start taking the responsibility and the burden on yourself, you're going to feel it in every part of your humanity, in your spirit, in your body, in your mind. It's going to start to weigh you down just like negative emotion and pain warn you that something's wrong in the body what do you do you don't try and just weather through it it's like we're gonna figure oh, out what man. this is right right 
right? So that's the verse that's important. Do not grow weary in well-doing. Yeah. In well-doing. <laughs> not to not grow weary in doing things that the Lord's like, okay, we're done. We're done here. Like, why is that hard? Lay it down. We're done here. Well done. We're going on. We're moving on. Why is that so hard for us? Because the world's like, oh, you failed. It didn't work. Da, 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 da. They're all the, you know, it goes like that. But it's like Elijah when the brook dries up. You know, we've talked about that before. The brook dried up. It was beautiful. It ran for three years. It was beautiful. It's now dry. What are you going to do? Are you going to get mad about it? Are you going to start digging in the dry stream bed because it was there once? Or are you going to never do it again? Like all these negative. Or are you going to say, wow, Lord, that was so beautiful. And that season is done. And then again, you just look at the universe. It's in seasons. <laughs> like God made things about seasons. Why? So we know that things begin and end and they all have their own beauty. They all have their own beauty, but you're growing, you're transforming, you're moving. What does that mean? Things change. And if you won't change, this system will well, it'll run you over because this system is in motion. And if you want to stagnate, you're going to die. You're going to end. I'm so stunned by this, Jamie. And the Lord is just speaking me right now through this conversation with you because one of the things in my own personal journey, and guys, you know this, um, I'm big on as an Enneagram one, I want to know what to do. I want the plan. I want the right. strategy. Yeah. I, strategist yeah. is one of my key identities, but overextended, Great. it's fear of losing control. And so here it is. One of the things I've been unpacking, Jamie, in my relationship with the Lord and in counseling has been self-improvement, self-discovery is sort of nonsense. And instead, what I've been learning is the process of vulnerability that leads to surrender, that leads to transformation, that leads to wholeness. Yeah. And so what's cool about this is, and guys, you'll remember this conversation. I, Jamie, I was talking to our friend, Paul Young, and uh, Paul yeah. was on the podcast yeah. a couple months ago, month ago. And I was talking to Paul about this, this process. And what I discovered, and it was actually a question I was going to ask you is like, well, Jamie, where's the Lord in all of this? I think the better question is, mm -hmm. Jamie, how do we then let go of the false identity to see the Lord exactly where he is? Because the Lord is right. there. We yeah. just can't see him when we're being motivated by fear, guilt, shame. Your thoughts. Right. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think that's the most beautiful um, question in all of it is. So, again, you know, sort of back to the Advent season, you know, yeah. God, the, the promises of, of God is always whenever, you know, I think in the Old Testament, I think there's seven times God or the angel of the Lord officially challenges a person. Mm -hmm. like Gideon and Moses and, and they all give the same five objections. I mean, there's not even a difference in, in humans when they object to things. They're always like, I don't, not good enough. There's the first one all the time. I mm -hmm. can't do it. Uh, you know, you don't know, understand who I really am. Jeremiah uh, one, but that, it's always this comment. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Jeremiah who starts that prayer of telling God, God doesn't know what's going on with this phrase. Oh, sovereign yeah. Lord. Yeah. Oh, sovereign Lord. You obviously don't know how old I am like that. Like this, this, this goofy statement that's so based in falsehood, but so, but God's answer to all the objections is always the same. He always gives the same answer. I am with you. That's always his answer. He doesn't lay out the big plan. He doesn't go, okay, look, I promise you, this guy's going to give you a lot of money. He doesn't do that. This is what he always says. I am with you, Emmanuel. I am with you. What's the good news of the kingdom? The king is here. Yeah. The king himself is here. So it's okay. It doesn't matter what happens. The king is here. And you are filled with the fullness of the Godhead. You have the mind of Christ. So what happens for us is that we stop tapping into that. We stop holding on to that. And so it, we have to have the voice of the other speaking to us what we do is start talking to ourselves right we just start talking to ourselves and so vulnerability to me i you know it's it, you know um it became such a popular topic with Brene brown but yeah right people that are fearful can't be vulnerable people that are fearful can't they don't know how to be vulnerable if you're afraid so you can't just tell someone here's the nine steps to be vulnerable like right. you'll never truth tell if you're afraid You'll self-protect and self-promote. You have to, or you're going to, you feel like you're going to die. So vulnerability 
to me starts with just being able to tell the truth. God, I would love to have joy and peace in this, but I don't think you're with me. I do not believe you're in control like this kind of thing. Truth tell. And then that's confession. And then ask God, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to say? Most of the time, the most reassuring, it's like talking to my grandkids when they're scared at night. The most reassuring thing you can say is not an explanation of how monsters don't exist. That's an objective, logical, rational argument that doesn't work. It's like, I'll sit in here with you. Boom, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. I said it to my wife the other day. I said, you know, because we're making this move. And I said to her, Like, I don't even care where we're moving, what's going to happen, as long as you and I are together. Like, if you and I are together, Mm -hmm. like of the same mind and heart, that this is the right way to go. I don't care what happens when we get there, because no matter what happens, we'll be okay because we're together. But if you and I are separate on this, no matter what's there, it's going to be awful. This Mm -hmm. This is the problem of sin, separate, separateness. So all God's saying is, look, I'm with you. Don't act like and believe that I'm not with you. Don't act like and believe that I'm not with you. Because if you believe that I'm not with you, you'll start acting like I'm not with you and you'll separate. So that's the warning to Cain. If you just do as you ought, just be who you really are, everything will be fine with you. Everything will be fine. That's the how not complicated this thing is. But if you... If you separate from me, if you separate from yourself, if you separate from your brother, you're going to die. And even when he does all that, God still stays with him. <laughs> you know? So to me, that's the, core, the deepest fear is that not, not just that something's out of control. It's that you're alone. Like that's it. You're powerless and alone. Nobody cares. God's not with you. People don't care. They'll throw you aside scarcity model and to that for the human is the greatest horror i mean it's it is hell right eternal separation it's hell to any human so we that's that's where the lie is that's what we have to battle is that so it's so that to me is my favorite thing the most important thing the most important thing is to stay in communion with God, in communion with your true self and in communion with others, Hmm. right? So like if I said to you, if I said, hey, Chris, just get rid of everything where you are. We're going to try something and we're going to let's all go together to Libya and just try something like I could do. We could do that, you know, like that. We could do it. We would be excited about that, even though we had no idea exactly what we were going to do. It's the idea of community. And like, no matter what we're going to do, we're going to have each other's back and we're just going to go try. But here's what we are going to commit to. We're going to love God. We're going to love each other. And we're going to love who we really are. There it is. Like, that's what, well, what if it, what if we can't predict it? What if it becomes chaotic? Here's what we're committed to. We're committed to each other. We're committed to each other, no matter what happens. And we will figure this thing out because God is for us. And what can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus? Can pandemics, can the collapse of our company, can, no, nothing can separate us from. So don't act like we're separate. Stop acting like you're separate and alone. You're not. So to me, vulnerability is the, is, is the ability to go, just to go say, tell, say the truth about that to another person, to a counselor, to your friend, to, to God. Look, this is how I feel right now. I feel so alone. To me, that's always the bottom line and powerless, probably that powerless and alone, trapped, can't get out, I'm stuck. And that just weighs us down, weighs us down because it's never true. I think I said this when we were together one time, raising our kids because we dragged them all over the world in war zones. Whenever something was going on in their life, I said, let me just keep reminding you of two things that are never true. You are never stuck and you are never alone. Though they'll tell you today as adults with kids, those are the two things that just got them through everything in life is the, is the truth is you are never stuck and you are never alone. Never, never, ever. That's what getting up in the morning and being with Christ is all about is, 
is that the the reassurance of that the truth of that that's why we need to be able to hear from god we need to understand who we really are and we need to understand love for the other right so i mean to, that's that's pretty basic but when you're in that when you're in that love god love others in the same way that you love yourself or be or love love then what happens is then you start to form these what what Tolan B calls the creative minority. Then you're you become the creative minority. Yeah. Right. And when you're in that creative minority, you cannot lose. You cannot lose because the goal of the creative minority is novelty and transformation. <laughs> That's what the creative it's the creative minority. They look for chaos. They long for challenge. That's what they want because it energizes, it calls forward their true identity, right? But it has to be in community. Has, Jesus is pretty clear, and we, that's why we have Trinity, the God that's never been alone, right? The Trinity is the creative community. Jesus, when he comes on the scene, his whole strategy for winning the, you know, the planet to go from less than 1% of the population of the Roman empire as believers to 60% of the Roman population as believers in 300 years with no army, no political power, no economic power, creative minorities. Hmm. And what did they, and it's fascinating because when you read the history of it, one of the things that they most shown forth in is pandemics and epidemics of sickness. Like that was what I mean, the Roman historians write about the Christians moving into cities that are dying from epidemics, not leaving the city. And look at the Christians today. We're arguing about whether you can't make me wear a mask. You can't. I am free. You can't. You know, China's making us wear. Like what? How, how much can you miss the opportunity to transform people by loving them? Damn, by caring so for good. them that's it we're right and we're all just into well what wh who's which which political figure said we have to wear masks or didn't say we have to wear like we're this is why if you ask me this is why the christian population in the u.s is dying is because this is where we're at hmm. all we want to do is be the political power that's what we want jamie can uh... Is it fair to say that perhaps creative minorities, because again, back to the phrase you and I were texting about, and I want to spend some time on that. Is it fair to say that maybe creative minorities is synonymous with ecclesia? Yes. Remnant? When you said both ecclesia and remnant, I'm going, oh my goodness. I've been talking to friends about there's a remnant of people who will rise up and serve people well and demonstrate kingdom, not Christian culture, but kingdom. Um, and, and really bring kingdom realities into their everyday life. And I, I just was curious about that, you know, and I, I want to go back there with you talk about Ecclesia. Cause I just finished reading Ed Silvoso's book on Ecclesia and I'm like, let's go. Yeah. Um, in thinking about the character qualities of creative minorities, because maybe someone's joined with us today and they're saying, well, how do I know I'm part of this or how do I become part of this or what is Jamie even talking about? I was thinking about maybe some character qualities of a person who is part of this ecclesia, remnant, creative minority. Um, the first of which is the people who have the most hope. Number two, the people who ask the best, best questions. Any thoughts on either contingency and maybe if you even have more? Because I want, I want people to really dial in in this conversation as we're early in 2021 and say, I'm not going to be distracted I am going to walk into this knowing who I am and my identity and in Christ and in the kingdom. And I'm going to bring kingdom solutions wherever I go. So any thoughts on those two? Yeah. Well, I mean that, so that's why the study of history is so fascinating. And when you see, when you see that again, what, what I love about like scripture is it's not about Christianity. It's about the reality of life. Mm -hmm. And, um, so when you when you're just reading the scriptures and you see these these characters like I mean like when you know the idea that what is to initiate you know humanity's um, management of the planet 
the God doesn't start with 10,000 people. <laughs> you know, it's like the idea is two yeah. or a small community and just saying grow because all of the universe operates on a seed grows and it can, and the seed can only reproduce itself. But the goal of the seed is die in order to reproduce itself in huge numbers. Right. Um, and so it, this, this whole idea from small to expansive, but each creative thing out of it is unique. It's not following a five steps to produce an apple tree. It's like this seed dies and it produces an apple tree that's distinct and unique and it, it's in its identity, but it's distinct from other apple trees and then all that whole thing. So this whole idea of being a creative minority is like, that's the way it's supposed to be. The goal is not to be the majority. That's not the goal. It's never been the goal. And so when Jesus says, um, go into all the world and make disciples, he's, he's not talking about a worldwide conversion program. It's not what he's talking about. He's talking about discipling people into followers of, the, the, of Christ, to be imitators of the highest form of humanity we've ever seen ever in history, Jesus. Like, that's the goal. Not to form a Christian empire or city or, you know, that kind of thing. And so, but to stay these these creative minorities. And you see it in the Old Testament with Joseph in Egypt and Daniel in Babylon and Jeremiah, who's writing at the time of Daniel in Babylon, saying, look, in this exile, here's what you do. You don't die. <laughs> you don't start a movement of, of rebellion. You, you grow. You, you get married. You build houses because when they grow, you grow. When, they, when, the, when the oppressor grows, you grow. <laughs> Don't try and kill them, overthrow them, like influence them, transform them. Like that's it. But stay, stay the creative minority. In history, when the creative minority has enough power, it becomes the dominant minority. And once they become the dominant minority, they stop creating. And all they start to do is maintain and control. That's the beginning of the end right there because it's no longer growing and transforming and death and resurrection. Now it's like, oh, we got it now. Okay, no, now we're going to make all the rules and everyone has to go by our rules and we're not changing anything. We're keeping this the same from now on. And then education dies and religion dies and government dies and meet, it all starts to die because there's no creativity. It's gone which means the spirit is gone. The spirit is not acting anymore, right? So in my own personal life, how can I, like Daniel or Joseph, be a creative minority? That's Just right. me, yeah, right? Because it's, I think Paul Young says it all the time. He says, the smallest number you'll ever be is four. It's you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's your creative minority. It can't be stopped. It cannot be thwarted that. So do you need 10 people? No. Mm. You need, do you have to be in charge? No, you can be in prison, Joseph. No, you can be sold into, into uh, in human trafficking, Daniel and his three friends. And, and yet you can end up, this is the beauty, influencing the whole thing like leaven. You know, like that's all it takes. So I need to be persuaded. Paul says, I have become persuaded that he is able to do what he says. <laughs> like, but I didn't just know it. I've become persuaded. So Paul's not going around trying to start movements of 20,000 stadium filled people. It's Priscilla and Aquila. Hmm. It's Epaphroditus. It's these little tiny groups. And then he just leaves. There's a creative minority. Let's go. There's a creative minority. There's this is all that's happening in the early church. And when they be, when Constantine comes into power, they become the dominant minority, and the whole thing starts to stagnate. Right. And so I can stagnate. When do I stagnate? When I'm in control and I know it. That's when you're going to die. This back to the beauty of chaos. 
the beauty of chaos. God will never let you sink into that lie. It's always like, no, 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 no. There's something I'm going to do. We're going to do a new thing tomorrow. A new thing's coming tomorrow. Like that's the beauty of it. So you can't just go, I got this figured out. It's this new thing. And so you stay a creative minority, but then, then when I'm interacting with another person, I'm challenging them to be a creative minority, Mm -hmm. maybe with me, maybe not with me, but whatever, like, and so then, you know, when you look at, when you look at the seven mountains of influence, you know, those books written on that topic, religion, family, education, government, media, arts, business, that's where do you want to be creative minority, wherever your identity is in any of those areas, right? There is no creative minority in education in the U.S. There is none. All we do, all Christians do is just, we withdraw. We withdraw. We're going to go start our own thing somewhere else. And you're not allowed to come unless you sign our document. It's like that. No, get, get uh, uh, redemptive participants, redemptive participants in everything, in the world, but not of the world. Re- Jesus is a redemptive participant. He's not buying into the lie. He's offering an alternative to the lie. That's what creative minorities do. Like everyone believes this lie that we're in, that money is the most important thing, that power is the most, that we all want to become, you know, these, these celebrity whatevers. That's the lie. What's the truth? You're unique. You're unique. Money's not in charge of everything. Vocation is not in charge of everything. How do we know? Look at that guy right there. Like, look at one of my, a guy emailed me and he said, I'm in full-time ministry, whatever that is. He goes, and I know I'm in the wrong place. I think I think I want to go into the marketplace. I'm an engineer. I want to go back into engineering and just get a job somewhere. What do you recommend? I said, just pick a big giant company that has a hundred thousand employees and go in there and be a creative minority. What a platform! Like it's waiting for you. And so he did. He did it. This is all in 2020. COVID forced him into it. Basically, he goes and he gets a job, and then he emails me because. He goes, I'm so excited. I'm working for this big whatever company and I'm on I'm in I'm on the worst performing team in the entire company. And I'm like, good, fantastic. Now transform that group, bring transformation to that little group of employees and start to transform the entire company. That's what a creative minority does. Don't avoid it. Be on the worst, pick the worst team, (laughs) be on the worst performing group and teach them how to be a creative minority first in their own heart and then out into the team and watch the thing transform. That's what all believers ought to be doing is that kind of thing. It's the modern day Joseph. It's the modern day Daniel. It's the modern day Esther. Jamie, it's amazing that we're saying this. I just got an email from a listener um, who listens to the show in the UK. And she basically was just expressing this desire and this need to step into her true identity. And, you know, things are just crazy in the UK with new lockdowns and all that. And she said, I want to still be able to live a life of influence. Where do I start? So I hope you're listening right now because I think this is the place to start. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so if you just view yourself, wherever you are is you, you, the goal is to be these two words together, creative minority. That's it. Don't try and what's the power in minority, Jamie? I, I, we've touched on it, but I, I, I want people to drill into this and go, there is something for me. And there is power in that. What is the power at stake with the word minority? What okay, does that empower things. me to do? So like when you think of Israel, when Israel, when, when, when God called Israel, yeah. he called them because they were little and of no regard. Yeah. Why? And he says, why? So that everyone will know that this came from me and not you. That's the point. Yeah. Like that's one. And so that's important. It's so that you realize who's really in charge of this who's really the one we're leaning on we're following christ so and then a minority a minority always has to be creative 
You're, when you're in power, you just get lazy. And that's why powers fall apart. They get lazy. They don't care anymore. And so then the next creative minority will come and destroy them. But so and the, but what more, maybe more importantly than anything, um, if you're a, if you're intent on being a creative minority, you a minority will not marginalize people. A minority will never have slaves. A creative minority will never be above another population. They'll keep interacting with other creative minorities. That's what they keep doing, right? But once you become the established, yeah, we're in charge, other people don't matter. Mm-hmm. So if, if the, mm-hmm. the United States, you know, every, every civilization began as, as creative minorities, all of them. They, they have, and they, so creative minority forms because there's an obstacle, there's a chaos, there's a challenge, and they're responding to it with a new way to handle it. And that's how they become, and they start to influence others. How do we walk this out day to day? How do you, Jamie, walk it out day to day so that we're not falling prey to familiarity, the spirit of familiarity, um, fear, guilt, shame? I'd love to know how you do it. How do we do it? Yeah. So again, oh, really to the basics of confession, I mean, just yeah. all the time, conf- truth telling. And so anytime I'm experiencing any negative emotion, then I want to move as quickly as possible into, okay, wait, what is this? Lord, what is this about? Mm. Not talking to myself, talking to the other, talking to love, talking to God. What is this about? Truth tell. Why I'm afraid. I'm burdened. I, I'm discouraged. I feel burnt out. Whatever. Go deep, as deep as you can. Spirit, guide, search, and know me and reveal this to me. What is it? So that you're always basing everything you can in truth. In truth. So, um, so. You know, I did a thing the other day and I I really wrestled through it because I felt like the group I was interacting with didn't think I was smart enough to be in the group. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was, I mean, really heavy was affecting me. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't matter whether they really thought that or not. Maybe they did think that. Maybe they even say it. We don't think you're smart enough to be in my group. Um, And it, it affects me. Why? Because I believe them. <laughs> like, because I believe them. Yeah, right. Um, and so once I, so now I'm getting my view of myself from other than God. Yeah. Right. And so I'm now separate from God, which has, and I'm getting my opinion of myself from another group or person, <clears throat> which separates me from myself which makes me not like the group, which separates me from others. It's so yeah. basic all the time, all the time. It's what it is. It's not, God didn't make this complicated. And so it's just like, ask me, you, the Lord's always saying to me, ask me about this, bring this to me and lay it down in front of me. Just lay it down. Stop carrying it around. It's too heavy. Lay mm. it down. And so I just, okay, what is this? And then, um, okay, I'm not as smart as those people. And the, and the, the Lord's question to me is, um, well, what is, how smart do you have to be? Like, what are you, you're not even talking about a real thing. Like, what are you talking about? As smart as what? As smart as who? Why are you comparing yourself to anybody else like that? I'm the one that gives you identity. So like as soon as, and then it's just like, oh my gosh. And usually 95% of this time, I'm actually wrong in what I think about what they think. There was a group six months ago. I'm in a group, pretty tense group, interracial group. And I just felt like I was contributing nothing to the group. And so there, I, 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 I really heavy. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to withdraw from this group because I'm not bringing any value to it at all. It sounded pretty noble. And I, so I was, I wrote the email, I was ready to send it, but boy, something inside of me is like, wait, 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 wait. And so I called one of my friends that's also in the group. And the, and I told the friend, I was like, you know, I don't feel like I'm really contributing to this group, blah, blah, blah. And, and he said, um, he goes, why are you going to leave me alone in this group? 
why are you going to abandon me in this group? Hmm. Who's, for whose value are you leaving the group? For my value. <laughs> hmm. For my. Mm-hmm. I didn't think anything about him being in the group. He goes, if you leave this group, it's going to hurt me. So then I like, okay, wow, you're right. That is so selfish. I'm really sorry. I'm glad I didn't send it. The next week, the leader of the group sends me a text and he goes, hey, I just want you to know how valuable you are to this group. <laughs> oh, I, the whole thing was false. But I could tell you based on what I didn't say, like they don't ask me my opinion a lot. Like, therefore, I, therefore, I have no vow. Yeah. Like, it's all false. It's all not true. It's all in my own mind and head and all that. So my daily practice is, and I really do it through the Beatitudes, you know, self-emptying, blessed are the poor in spirit. God, is there anything in me that's preventing me from receiving all that you have for me? Is there anything in me that's preventing me from receiving all that you have for me? That's where I start. So Jesus is the, is God is the God who self empties for the other. That's what he does. And so I'm going to self empty. And that's in that place of, is there anything in me that's preventing me from receiving? That's when the Lord's really like, yeah, you're, you're fearful. You're, you don't, you're self-focused, you're worried about money, like that's, and I'm becoming, it allows me to be vulnerable all the time. Like it allows vulnerability. Mm. And so, because I'm willing to tell the truth. Some people think vulnerability is transparency. It's not. Vulnerability is like, you can kill me and I'll be okay. That's what, I'm making myself vulnerable to you. Jesus made himself, he didn't tell people everything about what he was thinking all the time. Yeah. He made himself willing to die. That's vulnerability. Man, Jamie, it's it's the flow of this conversation is so enlivening for me because I remember you were talking to Derek Harden. Gosh, it was on a Zoom thing back in the spring, and you were you and Donna were on, and you were talking about walking through the Beatitudes, and uh, I think it was a, a place of discovery with you and the Lord where. You were kind of going through and saying, hey, Lord, is there any area of my life in which, and you were going through the Beatitudes. Spend a little more time on that for the listeners here today, Jamie. Like, how do we put that into practice? The self-emptying is fascinating to me because I'm, as I shared with you before we hit record here today, it is exactly where I'm at. And I'm I'm hungry and desperate for the one thing. Yeah. So self-emptying, like what self, self-emptying, I always think it, it makes you light. It lightens you because you're, you're get you're dumping stuff that you shouldn't be carrying. Yeah, so right. Good. That's what the beauty of it is. And so a lot of times when I'm visualizing myself, you know, when I walk through the Beatitudes, I'll tell you how I do it. It's pretty, it's a pretty, I do it pretty quickly. It's cumbersome at first, but it gets pretty quick, but I'm always, I visualize you know, I asked the Lord, like, show me where you are. Like, let me see you. And it's typically, I'm on some kind of like high mountain pass in the Middle East somewhere. And Jesus is with me and he's like a Bedouin guide. Like, that's just the image that pops in my mind all the time. And almost always he's, he wants to be in motion. He wants to like lead me up this path that's always going up, but I'm always carrying a backpack or something. And he's always saying, you drop the back. You can't climb with that backpack on. Like you don't need to carry that, like drop it, drop it. And then sometimes I'll hand it to him and he just throws it off the cliff. He's like, you don't need to carry all this stuff with you. Like, just stay with me. I'll take care of you. Like that's often the picture. And that's what self emptying is, you know, the kenotic life, the life of self emptying. And so that's, that's where the Beatitudes begins. And if you think of all of life as a process and a progression upward, which is how all of the universe works, it's a progression to higher forms. That's what everything is doing. And the universe is committed to life. It's committed to life and the advancement of life. And anything in the universe will die to bring that life forward. It's, it's so beautiful. Um, even stars will die to create new galaxies. So that's like, so what do I, why are you afraid to die? Because you don't know the truth about death. Death produces life. It's what Jesus is saying over and over again. Death produces, yeah, but my job could die. Good. 
Good. <laughs> like, why are you going to try and resuscitate that thing? Let it die. Because if, it, if God doesn't want it to die, it's not going to die. But if he wants it to die, why are you going to drag a dead carcass around with you? Yeah. And you're like, I'm exhausted. I know you're dragging all that junk around with you. You should be, your, your body is telling you, why are you do, carrying this? So self-emptying is very critical as the beginning stage, even of Jesus coming to earth is self-emptying the first step. Heaven is not something to be grasped, but he empties himself. So that's the beginning of the Beatitudes. And then it's a progression. It's almost a circle, but it's a progression to a life that is unstoppable and invincible. That's, that's, that's what Jesus is offering us. Because, and then he goes and shows it. Hmm. Rome can't stop you. Pharisees can't stop you. Liars, can, nothing can stop you. Death cannot stop you. And then he does it. He shows us, look, I went through the whole thing, every threat they had, everything possible, false accusations, the whole thing. And here I am. And guess what? We win. <laughs> and Augustus Caesar will die and be nothing really. Like, and that's the world is promising you. So self empty and it just goes like this, blessed are the poor in spirit. Yeah. And so once you empty yourself, you, once you've emptied yourself, then you just move to the, then, then, um, Blessed are the, I don't have them memorized all of a sudden. Blessed are the meek. Yeah. Yeah. Blessed are the meek. So once you're poor, once you've emptied yourself, like then, then you can corral all the passions that are all over the place and you can start to just bring them in and focus on them mm. like that. Or blessed are the merciful. Yeah. Blessed are the meek. Right. And then, and so like, then I can just channel these passions that are killing me. I want to be this. I want to be that. And you can just wait a second. Wait, I'm only going to focus on what God wants to give or what he has for me. And then I can just focus everything in that direction. And it's really beautiful to promise. Blessed are the meek. Why? For you, the earth is yours. <laughs> like take the earth, take the planet, take it. You'll inherit the entire earth, not heaven. We're talking about this life. How do I like receive everything God has for me in this life? By focusing all your passions and stop letting them control you right? By directing them, corralling them. You know, the idea is like a, a spirited stallion that's corralled and domesticated and direct, you can direct it. Otherwise your passenger just destroy you every day. And so blessed are those, you know, then it goes on through hunger and thirst for righteousness. Then you're like, God, I want to be hungry and thirsty for the things that you have for me. I love that. It's this divine discontent. It's like, I'm not satisfied. I'm not, I'm not. I hunger and thirst for what is right, for, for things to be as they ought, for me to be as I ought, for the world to be as it ought. And I hunger and thirst for it. And then God says, because if you hunger and thirst for what's right, I will fill you every day. It's manna, the idea of manna. Not enough for tomorrow, today. Like mm. that, hunger and thirst for righteousness. And you just progress you just progress through the eight Beatitudes onto mercy, which is about the other, caring about the other. It's a flow. Blessed are the blessed um, are the, the pure in heart. So pure in heart means I'm empty of everything. My passions are directed. I'm hungering and thirsting for what I ought to be and, and what ought to be in my life. And I'm extending mercy to others. That purity doesn't mean moral. It just means there's, it's completely single-minded. It's pure. The, 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 the desire, the goal, the direction is pure. There's, n there's no flaws in it. It's like this direction. I know because the pure of heart will always see God, always see God. So when you can't see God in what you're doing, it's like, cause you're distracted. Like you're looking somewhere else. Like what's distracting you? That guy's opinion of me. Ugh. Mm. empty here we go again back to empty like that pure in heart that when you can see god and you're following god and you're focused on him and you're hungry for him then you everywhere you go you're a peacemaker you become a peacemaker everywhere you are and so then you're a son then you're sons and daughters of god and then when you're in that place persecution won't even phase you <laughs> Blessed are the persecuted for theirs is the kingdom. Yeah. So you're, you're unstoppable. What are they going to do? Kill you? That's what Jesus said. What are they going to do? Kill you? They cannot. 
blessed are the persecuted. Like that's like the highest level is like, it doesn't even matter. Like persecution isn't even something you're thinking about, Mm -hmm. right? It's just part of it. So that's like, I just worked Uh, through that. Like, I mean, if you're doing that, you know, I do that like in right before I go into a meeting, sometimes I'm just like, okay, I'm going to self empty. Am I meek? You know, am I, am, you know, my hungry and thirsty for rights? Am I merciful? Can I see God in this? Am I going to bring peace to the room that I'm going into? Then it doesn't matter what happens. Then it doesn't matter what the result is. Let's go do it. Uh, Jamie, we've, we've given people today, uh, dare I say a generative blueprint for becoming a creative minority. And I'm so grateful for it. Is there anything else? Again, the focus of today's conversation, obviously we started guys, just to, just to wrap this thing, we started talking about chaos theory. So you would understand kind of the, uh, the breakdown of how to think about what to think in this, in this new season. Um, Jamie, we went into talking about you and the Lord, are a creative minority, but dare I say a majority of influence, like maybe not totally, a, yeah. a majority power, in size, but yeah. instead a majority of influence. I just want to make sure, Jamie, that you've gotten everything you wanted to share out. The floor is yours. If you have anything else to say about that, I, again, I, I just, uh, I value you so much. And if you, if you've got anything else to share, it's yours. Well, no, I, so then the, I think as you're doing that process is you're self emptying and you're thinking about the value of chaos, like, you know, so like people realize, wow, I don't have to commute. Like, why are we commute? Like, why are we commuting? Why are we sitting in traffic? Like we don't have whole companies that figure, wow, we don't have to do this. Right. So let's use that disruption to, you know, for the better. So what, one of the one, things that came to us is like, well, we could, I mean, like I, what I'm doing, I didn't stop what I'm doing because of COVID. I just do it, you know, on zoom. So it really doesn't matter where I live. Right. So very few people think, wow, it doesn't matter where I live. Most people think I've got to live here, but you don't, you can. And so the chaos forces you to go like, I can live anywhere and do what I do. And that's, that can be super liberating to people. These, so that chaos is helpful. So, but so as you're self emptying and you're becoming lighter and you're not, you don't have to carry all these burdens around all the time. um, Then you can ask the question of, okay, so, I, it, it, wherever I am, there's these mountains of influence, religion and family and education and government and media and arts. And business. Where, where am I to be a creative minority? Where? Like, who are my people? Where? And so you can be a creative minority. Hmm. And as the Bible shows us, because someone, because it looks like someone else has complete control over you, like Nebuchadnezzar over Daniel or Pharaoh or, or, or Joseph's brothers, but they don't see that's the lie. They don't. And, and Augustus forces the world to be taxed. And what yeah. he does is he sets, he goes right into the prophecy of the, of the old Testament. He's yeah. not in charge. He thinks he's in charge. He's not in charge. And that's the beauty is God is above it all. God yeah. is not victimized by mean bosses, diseases. He's, all of it. He uses for good. You intended it for evil. God uses it for good. Right. So mm. there's this in, intense freedom. Yeah. So when the brook dries up somewhere, your greatest freedom is then move, like move, Yeah. you know, move, change locations, change jobs, change like you're free, you're free people stop acting like slaves. Right. So that's my, so then like, let's, if each of us were just like moving in our true identity, believing God is with us, thinking of the other more than ourselves, then where would you be? Really? Where would you be? Would you be where you are right now? Or would you be in a different location, job, relationship? Like if the brook has dried up, it's because God's got something next, next level, next level. When you move, you always want to ask God, if I move, is it moving me this way or backwards god doesn't move backwards he moves forward so that's my question if we're gonna relocate from where i am to another place i ought to be able to write down how is this a progression and transformation forward right it may be to go do something that i've done before again but then to do it at a higher level i love that god loves to take people back into things they've done in their past as 
but to take them back in it as the new person. And he says, do it again. Try yeah. it now. Watch what happens this time when you do that. So you can see your growth. So that's what I would just encourage people. Um, mm. Look at your city, look at your town, look at wherever you are, your family, yeah. where, and look at where am I to be a creative minority? Where? And, and we got, we got to get back to that. Our country needs it <laughs> desperately. The world needs it, but. I want to put a period on this amazing sentence. And guys, I, I want to remind you of something that Jamie said to all of us back in 2016. And, and that is this, that you will never know what to do until you know who you are. And right. it really starts with identity. Um, Jamie, before I want to have you talk about kind of what you and Donna are doing, and then you've got a new course coming out. I'd love to have you tell everyone about, but before we do that, would you be so kind as to just lead us maybe through a moment of listening prayer? I, I yeah. want to, I want to kick this thing off. We're, we're in January, 2021. Let's ne- let the next 11 and a half months be powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, thank you for mm. just moving us forward through all that's going on that the pandemic, the, the racial issues that we have to face in our country, the marginalization, the economic disparity, all of these things that the Holy Spirit will not tolerate, will not let just go on forever. The Spirit of God will create transformation and change. And even though we resist it, that's what's going to happen. So, Lord, would you just help us to, number one, just truth tell empty ourselves of all the things that prevent us from moving with you and receiving from you. All of the fear, all of the guilt, all of the shame, wrong belief about you, wrong belief about ourselves, wrong belief about other people. Lord, would you just just help us to lay these things down to be free of these and to, and to constantly ask you, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to do? It's a very beautiful, basic confession, us telling you what we believe to be true and repentance, then you telling us what is true, mm. and then transformation, us moving into the true. So we, we just, Lord, reaffirm that, guide us into that in 2021, um, so, that we, so that we can become who you've made us to be, mm-hmm. whatever that is, that we can be fully become who you've made us to be by being not conforming to patterns in the world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind and just presenting ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto you. Just moment by moment. And then Lord, unleash that creative spirit in us, that creative ability that allows us to co-create with you and be revived and refreshed and facing challenges and not afraid of them, taking them on in all the areas of our society that are desperate and help us to be the true called out ones, the true ecclesia, in all the new ways that you have for us to be that. Not old wine and old wineskins, but new wine and new wineskins. And give us vision about what that church looks like in the coming age as we grow and change and transform. So we commit all this to you knowing that you are always with us, that nothing can separate us from you. No created thing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And to hold firm to that, Lord, and to be filled with love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. And let us be a, a light to the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Jamie, you've got a new course coming out. Um, Donna mentioned that we're going to make the, the latest webinar available to listeners and viewers and such. Tell us how to connect, where to find you, where to find Donna, about the new resources laid on. Yeah. So on our on our website, identityexchange.com, yeah. um, we've got some we've got some studies on there, the energy study, the energy series that become the um, uh, knowing rediscovered or pretty basic. But we just finished filming one um, called Becoming What You Believe. It's from mm-hmm. that passage where Jesus turns to the blind man and says, what do you want me to do for you? It's a beautiful passage. And they say, we want to see. And he says, may it be as you have believed. And so we wanted to do an intensive, a deep dive into that process, kind of what we've been talking about. What does it mean? How do you become what God has you to be? Mm-hmm. And so it's a, it's an intensive, there's going to be two options. You can do it on your own. 
Um, you'll find it all there on the website. It'll be, we're going to release it probably in February. And we filmed it down in California at, okay. in, um, in a vineyard. It's really beautiful. And, um, and then, and there, or you can do it with us. So there's two options. You can do it with Don and I, um, where you can interact with us through the course, or you can just do it on your own with the videos. Uh, either way, it's up to you. We just want to make it available. So super mm -hmm. excited about that. And um, yeah, more to come. We hope, we hope in the future. We've got a book coming out in 2022 called Finding Faith in a Freaked Out World with Baker Books. Um, but I have to wait till 2022 for that one. So, so good. Well, undoubtedly, We'll have you back on the show for that. I uh, I work yeah. with Baker on the regular with uh, with Baker authors uh, for the podcast, so I'm I'm super stoked. But Jamie, cool, good your gifts. I'm so grateful for you and Donna. Thanks for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. You're welcome.